Today, I'm going to my friend David's house to wait for some big news. He's not going to be there because he's been in prison for the last 28 years. Grandma, while well, you were gone, he called so many times. This is why you shouldn't have left. <laughs> Third degree. When I stay here, nobody calls for me. <laughs> Yesterday, yes, it run twice. Yeah, you call <laughs> and uh, the people from I the agency. I think I called twice. Call. Yeah. Who else called, Gary? That's the two calls that came yesterday. Anybody Nobody else, else called. Any minute now, David is going to call and tell us the result of a decision that could finally bring him home to his family after all these years. Oh, man. Call it up. Call David and get it over with. Speaker first. Now three. Now I can put it back on speaker. Hello? Hey. What's up, man? How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Hey, where mom at? Oh, she's right here next to me. Can yeah. I speak to her, please? Sure. She was on speaker. Hello? Hey, sweetie. How you doing? I'm okay. You got some good news for me? My name is David McCallum. I am 43 years old. I've been incarcerated since I was 16 years old for a crime I didn't commit. David is a convicted murderer from the streets of Brooklyn. I'm a middle-class Jewish-Italian kid from Toronto. So how did two people who seem to be so different end up becoming good friends? When I was a teenager, David wrote me a letter that really surprised me. The words were so kind and sensitive. Not exactly what you'd expect from a man who'd spent 20 years locked up for murder. Over the last 10 years, David's become like the older brother I never had. And I've become part of a team of people fighting for his freedom. I think you've done more for me than I have done for you, to tell you the truth. I was a, pretty much a kid when I came to this place. I haven't been anywhere, really, you know? And sometimes it, you can't really quantify it into words, you know what I mean? How much it meant to seeing life outside of this place. You know, this is a dark place. You know, and I say this to people all the time, and I've never actually said it to you to put it in perspective, but you've been in jail my whole life. You've missed my entire life of experiences. And what you've given to me in, in terms of how you've helped me grow up, it just makes me want to do anything I can to, to help you. So, how would you compare yours and David's upbringing? You know, he came from a big Southern family, and I came from, you know, I was the only child. 
But I think the similarities are that we were both good kids at heart who got in trouble because we were trying to fit in. We're gonna make a very simple dish today. <laughs> As a kid, my parents and I were really close. It was always just us three. I come from a very mixed neighborhood in Toronto. It wasn't a bad place, but the people that had adopted a criminal lifestyle, they were feared and respected. And I wanted that same respect, so I tried to act like them. We were concerned about the friends that you had. You know, ultimately all of those kids are good-hearted, but some of them were in trouble themselves. Some of them carried guns. In my neighborhood, when you tried to act tough, you had to back it up. And I couldn't, so I got bullied, and that made me angry. You know, I was an asshole to my parents during that time. And my dad just wasn't gonna take my shit and so we were always at each other's throats. You had a lot of anger, and sometimes people do things they don't understand the consequences of. There was this dude who I thought had stolen from me. You know, we got in a verbal confrontation. The verbal confrontation ended, took a brick, and I just whipped it through his front window. And then I ran away, <laughs> which is probably the opposite of being tough because the kids in my neighborhood would just knock that guy out. He called the police and I got arrested. I think for my parents, that was the turning point. I reached the point where I felt I had completely lost control of uh, you and your upbringing. Uh, maybe I felt too that I didn't know you anymore. Not the way I thought I knew you. Uh, and I thought, I have this friend who's in a prison. I felt that um, he could give my son the straight goods, whereas whatever I'm saying to him might be just so much BS. You know, he'll say, bah, forget about it, uh, Dad. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. But he can't say that to uh, a man who's in prison. So I wrote to David and I said, would you be willing to correspond with my son. He's been getting into some trouble. November 28, 2005. Dear Ray, hello and how are you? I met your dad nearly two years ago after reading an interview he conducted with Ruben Hurricane Carter. Me and your dad have become really good friends and I was hoping that we too can become friends I was around your age when I came to prison. I really want to write to you. And I often thought about the privilege of writing to his son. When you said the privilege of writing his son, that was the first thing in that letter that sort of like put my guard down and let me listen to you right. without the guard. Uh, that sense the urgency in his voice in his letters. He felt like he did everything he could to, to get you, you know, to understand that uh, that kind of lifestyle leads to some bad shit, you know? This is David's first grade picture. He never was a real bad kid. He did his lessons very good. So there was no problem with his lessons. He was good with that. I was born on December 12th, 1968 in Dillon, South Carolina. I mean, I'm proud to be a Southerner. People make fun of that, but that's okay. That's all right. We had a good time back then. I was a third of seven brothers and sisters. You know, my mom is a very, very good cook, and she pretty much does it all in terms of like collard greens and, and, and mashed potatoes and fried chicken. When she can do wonders, believe me. My father, you know, had a difficult time finding work. My mother and my father thought there were some better opportunities for us. So my family moved to New York City when I was eight years old. It 
it was a culture shock for me, man. And I used to hear all kinds of noise in the street. When I was a kid, I used to always see these fire trucks zoom up and down my block, you know? And I was curious as to what they did, where they were going, what happened. It just really confirmed why I wanted to be a fireman because those people were going to help somebody, you know? And I think as a kid growing up, I always wanted to be a hero. You know, but it was rough, man. I mean, I see some horrible things, seeing people get shot. You know, I seen people get stabbed. I started hanging out with a lot of rough individuals, so if you didn't be tough at that time, then you would become somewhat of prey. People would be picking on you. I um, started committing crimes, like robberies, and I wanted to be somewhat important. You know, knowing that I was into these kinds of activities would make me important. Yeah, my father, of course, he would always tell me, look, either two things are going to happen to you. He said, either you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life or you're going to be dead. I got up early Sunday morning like I do on most Sundays, ate breakfast. Um, I was more of a cereal guy than anything. Well, on that particular Sunday, we decided that we were going to go to the park, a junior high school 296. I had like a, a friendly competition with my sister Maddie. We went around 12 o'clock and we played handball. We always had this thing with you can beat me, no you can't, I can beat you. We finally played each other in this very handball court, in this park, and I beat them. <laughs> this is where David was at the time that Nathan Blenheim was kidnapping. In the park that day, Willie was there too, and Willie was a friend of mine as well. He lived about maybe seven blocks from where I lived. And we didn't hang out all the time, but we hung out occasionally. We pretty much went at it all day playing. You know, we went home after that, between 6 and 6.30. Uh, my mom was preparing dinner. It was just like any other Sunday, you know. It was just simply another day. October 27, 1985, when I went to the store, that was the last time I've been home. I'm sitting on some steps with a group of friends, and I noticed a detective car show up, and three Police officers got out of the car and they said to me, would you mind coming down to the precinct for questioning? I said, okay. I didn't do anything wrong. We were driving down and one detective said to me, if you fucking keep leaning on me, uh, I'm gonna slap the shit out of you. At that time, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but I knew it was a problem. So when I got down to the 83rd precinct, they took me upstairs to a very small room with no windows. And I sat there for what it seemed like forever, really. Joseph Buddha was a, was a police officer. He was saying that they had found uh, a body in a park, in Aberdeen Park in Brooklyn. Someone was killed. And I said, I, I don't know what, you, what you're talking about. Detective Buddha, I'd say that he was a very, very intimidating guy. He was an 18-year veteran. And he had a lot of experience. I was very scared. He asked me, did I know Willie Stuckey? I said, he was a friend of mine. A police officer Buddha said to me that Willie said, I shot Nathan Blenner. He brought Willie Stuckey to the door. He said to Willie Stuckey, is that him? And Willie nodded his head, yes. I couldn't believe it. Why, why the fuck would he, why would he say that? Why would he say? that I killed somebody when he knew that we, neither he or I was there. Buddha said, look, if you tell me what happened, I will let you go home. And I said, officer, I don't know what you're talking about because I've never driven a car in my life, ever. I've never been to that particular neighborhood. 
didn't know anything about Nathan Bennett. And it was at that moment when I said that I didn't know who he was talking about that he slapped me in my face. He picked up a chair and he was threatening to hit me with the chair. I knew right then that I had to say something and I had to tell this officer what he wanted to know. And then I said yes, literally repeating what he had previously said to me. At that time, I was willing to do and say anything they wanted. Willie was pointing the finger at me. You know, if he's saying I did it, well, I'm going to say he did it. I'm going to say he shot the person. Detective Buddha started feeding me details. He would say, for example, you saw this guy sitting in his car, right? And so when he say, right, what I did was I just said, yes, we did, you know? And then he would actually ask me another question, and then it would just go on and on and on and on again. Buddha said, look, we got a videotape set up. You're, you're going to go in there and you're going to repeat exactly what you repeated to me. That was it. Sir, what is your name? David McCallum. Oh, okay, Mr. McCullum. You have the right to remain silent. That is, you do not have to speak to me or answer any of my questions. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Anything you say to me can be used as evidence against you in a court of law. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Now that I've advised you of your rights, do you want to speak to me about what happened? <coughs> yes. We have brought the boy, <coughs> we have brought the man in through the exit of Abbott's car right. and took him through the back. Okay. My friend, huh? Let me bring, let me start you from earlier in the day, okay? Right. Okay. Um, where were you earlier in the day? Appearing on videotape. It was absolutely and unequivocally the worst mistake of my life. I, I don't think anything can, can actually compare to that. Anything. Okay, so we just got off the train in Queens, and uh, there was this parked car, and it was this man sitting there. Well, he stuck the gun to the car window and told the man to get out. So the man got out, and we had got in, and he told the man to get back in, and so he got back in. And then the guy asked us where we was going. He said we was going for a little ride. I felt like it was important for me to try to make my confession more believable to the officers there. So what I did was I put details in the confession. And the guy just asked, what were you, what were you doing? He, he just told the guy, you know what time it is. Then he clicked and then the gun went off and then the guy fell and he was laying on the ground. And his arms, he was moving his arms and then he had left. When someone looks at the confession, they would see that information that was supplied by Willie Stuckey, in the confession that I made, they were totally inconsistent with one another. Before we got off the block, I gave him the gun. He had the gun, Willie Stuckey, he had the gun on at all times. I heard three shots. I heard a shot first, I heard one shot, and then I heard two more shots. After Willie fired the gun the first time, did he fire any other shots after that? No, only heard one shot. I have no further questions, thank you. One o'clock, the phone ring. I answered the phone, and they said, do you have a son by the name of David McCollum? And I said, yes. Where is he? They said, we have him at the precinct. So I said, well, he's only 16. I say, he need one of his parents there. He said, if you come, you can't see him. Hey David, thanks for sharing your story with me. It was eye-opening, to say the least. Hearing about where you're from and what happened to you has definitely made me rethink my own actions and decisions. I have a lot to be thankful for. I bring to you the message that I heard in prison. I am a survivor, a survivor of the American so-called criminal justice system in the same way. Ken was a teacher, and his class wrote me letters uh, asking me to appear uh, at their school to speak with them. And I did. 
It was my dad's way to meet one of his idols, Ruben Hurricane Carter, the legendary boxer who was incarcerated for 19 years for a crime he didn't commit. And as I began to know Ken Klonsky a little more, we decided to do an article for the Sun magazine. A lot of people saw that, including David McCallum. David read the interview and he contacted me. So the world, sometimes you choose and sometimes it chooses you. And I, I just decided I wasn't gonna turn away from this person. David asked my dad to go over his trial transcripts because he wanted to send them to Ruben. So even though he's not a lawyer, my dad just started going through them himself. The first time through, it was fairly clear to me that he was guilty. But then I decided I'm gonna take a second look at this. And the second time through, the whole case came apart. So my dad retired from teaching and managed to get Reuben Carter on board to help with the case. Reuben's star power helped attract Oscar Michelin, a lawyer who had successfully fought some other wrongful conviction cases in New York. My opinion of David is that he's got a tremendous heart, tremendous courage, and there's no hatred, there's no seeking of vengeance, and to stay positive. I, I don't know how he does it, frankly. My dad provided the emotional support for David. He talked to him on the phone every week, kept his head in the right place. Ruben was our face, the spokesperson, and Oscar was our lawyer. With everything happening, I looked at the court documents one day and couldn't believe they could convict somebody with so little evidence. I became convinced of David's innocence and really wanted to get involved. As the team began to reinvestigate the case, the first step was to look back into what actually happened to Nathan Blenner. I think for me it's easy to forget that there's another victim in this case other than David. The crime itself is really shocking. So we're here now at the scene of the crime. That's where Nathan's car was parked. He was getting ready to go, getting started, when a couple of boys who were playing in the street saw uh, two young male blacks come down this street. One of them took out a gun. This is their testimony. They then heard one of the abductors tell Nathan, get the F in the car. They pushed him in the car, and they drove off. The day after Nathan Blenner was kidnapped from the Ozone Park neighborhood of Queens, his body was found in Aberdeen Park in Brooklyn. His car had been burned and left in an empty lot. One week later, David McCallum and Willie Stuckey were arrested and charged with the murder. New York City in the mid-1980s, crime was at an all-time high because of gangs, gun violence, and crack. There were multiple murders every day. The police that time had their hands full. Courts were fed up. People had had it, jurors had had it. We wanted our city back. And all those pressures were coming to bear into that courtroom when David and Lily were ushered into it for their trial. It wasn't just about their case, it was about all of the crime that was going on in the city at that time. When this case was tried, this was before the days of DNA evidence. And that's very important, because one of the things that DNA evidence has established is that people do falsely confess to crimes, particularly young teenagers. On top of that, this was one of the early days of videotaped confessions. So it was very unusual for a jury to be able to actually see the defendant allegedly confessing to the crime. Here you have the guy right in front of you on film. You can see that there's no gun to his head. So in the end, nobody believed that those confessions were coerced. These two teenagers had no chance with professional interrogators. And that's the only so-called evidence that the state presented was this false confession. To see if we could find anything that was missed at the trial, Reuben Carter sent the tapes to Steve Drizzen, one of the world's leading experts on false confessions. If you simply look at the tapes, you get the impression that the person on the tape may in fact be guilty. 
because the tapes don't tell the story. One signifier of a false confession is that the confession doesn't lead police to any additional evidence. There's nothing in that confession that the police officers didn't already know from some other source. Not a single fingerprint anywhere in the car that belongs to McCallum or Stuckey. I mean, these are teenage kids. And we know from scores of cases that juvenile suspects are more vulnerable than adults to the kinds of police techniques that we see over and over again. And you have both Stuckey and McCallum independently saying that they were struck by the lead detective, Detective Buda. What's his reason for being there? He's not conducting any questioning. He is there to intimidate David McCallum. But I would say that the most important factor to me in the confession is what we call a false fed fact. When police canvassed Nathan Blunder's neighborhood, they interviewed a woman who we'll call Chrissy. Chrissy could have been a key witness, but she was never brought into the trial. Around the time of Nathan Blunder's abduction, Chrissy was washing her car on the street when she was accosted by two black males. One of them in braids. They come up to her and say, hey, you got a nice car. Neither McCallum nor Stuckey wore braids. Now, that occurred within an hour before Nathan Blunder's abduction. Stuckey's confession has this account of meeting a woman or a girl on the street. Now, why is that important? Because her description of the offenders doesn't fit Stuckey and McCallum. The jury had no idea that someone had given a description of two male blacks that did not match McCallum and Stuckey's description at or around the time of the crime. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous. David's court-appointed lawyer dropped the ball in pretty much every way possible. He never visited the crime scene. David says he was interviewed only once before his trial, and he failed to even bring Chrissy into the case. He was later disbarred. Tell me about your lawyer. I mean, well, for the camera, I'm gonna be very kind here. So I'm gonna say that he was grossly incompetent, to say the least. What do you really think? He was a piece of shit. There was reasonable doubt all over the place. So when you open up the file, you see the route for his exoneration right there. David's lawyer had this evidence and didn't use it. So it can't be used for an appeal now. That's just the way the law works. Had he had better representation at trial, he'd probably walk in the streets right now. The only evidence linking these guys to this crime is this confession. And little did he know that this five minutes of testimony was gonna cost him the rest of his life. Uh, it's really tragic. The verdict was guilty on all charges. Um, I was convicted for felony murder and for intentional murder and uh, robbery and kidnapping. For me, it was almost like in slow motion because I was still waiting for a not guilty verdict. I was really afraid to turn around to see the reaction of my mother because I know she's gonna be hurt. I didn't cry at that time because I was too much in shock, but as soon as I went back to the bullpen, I started crying there because I, at that time, realized that I wasn't gonna be going home. You don't ever get used to it, but sometimes it, it just takes everything away from me, and sometimes I just try to block it out of my mind, but it still come back. Hey, Ray, to tell you the truth, I do still think about that confession every day. It was the biggest mistake of my life, and it used to make me angry. But over the years, I've learned that if you spend time feeling sorry for yourself, you're missing out on opportunities to move forward with your life. I hope you learned that too. If he's not an angry prick after everything he's been through, you know, what right do I have to be? David used his story 
and his experience to show me that I'm free to shape my future and follow my dreams. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty powerful thing for a young person to realize. David's given him a sense of the value of his own life. And it's not something that he should throw away lightly. And uh, he's got opportunities that David never had. What's up, Ray? I'm so glad to hear your business ideas are becoming reality. That's amazing. Congratulations. I feel like I'm along for the ride with you. I'd always wanted to own my own business. So some friends and I got together and we opened up a restaurant for students in Montreal. David gave me the confidence to, to say, you know, I could do whatever I put my mind to. I had always dreamed about making films and TV shows. He encouraged me. I got my grades up and I actually got into film school. All these amazing things were happening, but the question was always on my mind. What can I do to help David? How can I pay him back for everything he's been doing for me? I told every single one of my friends about David. It was my first ever video class, and I met Mark, you, and I was like, I wanna go down to New York and interview David's family, and you were like, yeah, cool, that'd be awesome. So Mark and I headed down to New York and met David's family. We met Oscar. Yeah, well, they almost. We went to Toronto to see Ruben. How are you? I'm perfect, brother. Man. And everywhere we went, we would talk to people and tell them about David and tell them David's story. We weren't sure how this was actually going to help, but we had to do something. So, uh, going out to see David today. He just got transferred to a new prison. Uh, it's Otisville Correctional Facility. It's about an hour and 45 minutes from New York. He's been so kind of down lately, so I try to go see him a lot. What are you guys gonna talk about today? We'll probably talk about the case. We'll talk about parole, which is coming up. David's sentence is 25 to life. So after 25 years, he's eligible for parole. David's had three parole hearings so far, and he's been denied each time. David's fourth parole hearing is coming up, and we're hopeful that he's finally gonna be able to come home to his mother, sister, niece, and nephew, who continue to support him year after year. I really believe I have an opportunity based on the things that I've done in prison, you know, my accomplishments, and I've, been, I've managed to stay out of trouble and I get along with people. So I think, I've, I've, I think I'm a perfect candidate, objectively speaking. David tells me that you uh, are quite the, um, the computer whiz, that you're gonna teach him how to use a computer when he gets out. Yep. What are you going to show him? I want to show him how to you turn it on and how does it work. <laughs> it's easy to forget how little David knows about the world that we live in. People spend 20 years in prison and you come out of prison, you're bam right back here in society and you know nothing about this society. David has never used the internet. He's never used a cell phone. He's like, I, I'm pretty bad at this internet. There's Googles and Facebook. When I'm visiting with him, sometimes he'll ask me like how to flirt with girls or like dating and stuff like that. If he gets out on parole, then he gets out as a murderer. And you know, good luck getting a job when every application you have to fill out says, have you been convicted of a crime? Yes, which crime? You know, murder. So David's next parole hearing is coming up. But parole doesn't mean freedom. And that's what we're all really fighting for. It is very difficult to overturn a jury's verdict. I've had some of the best known people in the whole world supporting me. And yet, even with all of that support, I just narrowly escaped through the eye of a needle. When I was 17 years old, I filed a number of appeals on my own. Some of the issues were uh, ineffective assistance of counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, and the fact that the confessions were false. 
a self-written appeal by a prison inmate without a high school education, without the assistance of a lawyer, had no chance in hell. And so after eight years, all my pills were exhausted. The law is clear. Once an argument is raised and considered by an appellate court, that argument is gone for good for that defendant. The only way to secure David's freedom now is to find new evidence and make new arguments. As the team really started to dig into David's case and, you know, search for new evidence, Mark and I tagged along as often as we could. We even went out by ourselves to search for any information that could help. Did you know any of the kids that worked here? No. If I said some names, you wouldn't know anyone? No, no. I don't know what I would have done had I found something, but I was just doing whatever I could do. I don't want his name, my name, anywhere in David McCollum's whatever. We tried the victim's family. We tried the Stucky family. We talked to people in the neighborhood who knew David back in the day. But for a fact, I know that as far as David knew anything, he had nothing to do with it. We even tried the two witnesses who saw Nathan get taken away. They were 11 years old at the time. Oh my God, I don't know. You don't know where he lives? He's I just- I can't give you that information, sorry. I think that's for us. I think it is for us. Hey David, I'm out here doing everything I can for you. Nobody will talk to us though, and it's really frustrating. What happened to Nathan was so awful that I understand now why no one wants to revisit the past. Every single part of this whole thing is infuriating. Boot is dead. His okay. partner's dead. Willie's dead. Willie's dead. Uh, David's lawyer's dead. David's lawyer's dead. Everything just feels like a waste of time, but it's like, what else are you supposed to do? For me to walk out of here, it's gonna take someone coming forward to say that they actually committed this crime or there's going to be strong evidence to suggest and prove that I'm innocent, along with Willie Stuckey. Short of that, um, you know, I, I don't think it's gonna happen. My oldest sister, Ella, she's probably the person I think about the most. My sister was born with cerebral palsy. That means she has a disability that doesn't allow her to do some of the things that I'm able to do. I didn't know she didn't have a bone in the back. I know when I set her up, she fall over. But when they x-rayed and everything, they said she doesn't have a spine in the back. They told us that she wouldn't live till she get 13. That bothered me for a while. But after she passed 13, it didn't bother me anymore because I said, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. How, how old is she now? She's 52. My sister is my hero for the very reason that she's probably one of the strongest individuals I've ever met, that I've ever seen in my life. She, just, she didn't ask to be in her circumstance. Um, God made it that way, and that's fine. But my sister is my sister, and that was, that's a tough one, man. David. Hello, David. Hello, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just great. Uh, how about you today? He gets very down. And when you're talking to him, you feel it to such an extent that it's, it's as if you're being drawn underwater. Still a light at the end of the tunnel? There always is. There's, There's always, always the next appeal. There's always the next uh, parole hearing. There's always the next uh, investigation. You never know what you're going to find. We're trying to crack a 28-year-old case. It's a pretty monumental task, and we needed help. Has your work ever gotten in the way of any of your relationships? Absolutely. 
I would have to say my relationships had gotten in the way of my work. <laughs> <laughs> I read about this guy, Van Padgett, who had helped some other people who had been wrongfully convicted. As far as my professional career, this is the call I've been waiting for. I done met with David, I done told David, and I don't know what possessed me to say it, that I'm bringing you home. So <laughs> it's like, I'm in. When the police searched Nathan Blenner's burnt car, they found cigarette butts in the ashtray. These cigarette butts had never been tested for DNA because the technology didn't exist at the time. Ruben and Oscar successfully petitioned the Brooklyn DA's office to test the cigarette butts. And lo and behold, the lab found a match. The DNA isn't David's, it's not Willie's. It's somebody totally new that we had never heard about before. This is it right here. It was the first break in David's case in over 20 years. Yo, B. Van used his shady private investigator connections and he found Mr. DNA. This guy was 14 in 1985. So I don't think that he killed Nathan Blenner, but he was in that car smoking cigarettes. So he knows something. He's our only direct connection to Nathan Blenner's car. Now this button is a little bigger. It's a lens? Yeah. Let's do it. In one day's feet, you will arrive at your destination. I don't know, yes. Is it rolling? Rolling. Oh. I wish I was up there right now. Hey, how you doing? Excuse me, good morning. How you? Good. 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 Little guy. <laughs> good morning. My name is Van Pageant. I'm a private investigator. I'm here to see Mr. Yeah. Can I speak to you for yeah, a second? Sure, sure. How you doing? You look familiar, man. This is uh, Mr. Oscar Michelin. Okay, so I, I'm the attorney who's working on the case. Okay. You know, Mr. McCown's been in since 1986. We're trying to figure out what happened that day. So, done the DNA tests of, of what was in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And you've got two cigarette butts with your DNA on it in the car. You know, that's highly unlikely. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, you know, when I was young, I used to smoke. and. <laughs> We used to throw cigarette butts all over. Right. Things coming from school, coming from here. We used to just pluck. It didn't even make a difference. But the name wasn't pulled out of a hat. You know, for DNA, when you get a false hit, it's not a false positive. I listen. Like I said, I see a, more, a lot of abandoned cars. Right? A lot of them burnt. A lot of them are stripped. You know what I'm saying? But you know, like that didn't even spark me. I didn't. You know. I don't it's, we, <laughs> your you DNA know. is on two cigarette butts you know, in the ashtray in that car. That is a fact that we have to deal with. You asked me to cooperate. I'm trying to help you to the best of my ability. You know, you said my DNA come up. I don't recall, you know, why my DNA would be in a car. The problem was... You were in that car smoking cigarettes. I'm telling you, I wasn't. That could be your take on it, but I, I wasn't. So, honestly, I don't know what to make of it. I, you know, it could be that he just doesn't remember. I, I think... He's holding back, and as I said to Van, it really doesn't matter if he's telling the truth or not. Yeah. How do you figure? Because what are we going to do? We're going to tase him? <laughs> We're going to waterboard him? What are we going to do? Yeah. When he comes to declare, he'll look you right in the face, and he says, I have no idea. In retrospect, I guess I, I kind of feel stupid, but, you know, I don't know. I just I thought that, you know, he'd have nothing to lose. He was only 14. We don't think he killed him. So like, what's he, maybe he is hiding something, you know? Who knows? 
I mean, the hardest part is like, you know, what do you tell David after that? I just hope that I'm one of those individuals, you know, that make it, you know, because some people, unfortunately, they don't make it out, you know? Willie and Stuckey didn't make it Willie out. Willie Stuckey didn't make it out. This is too dangerous in this prison. Any show of disrespect can mean your life. There's always life and death struggles behind those walls. Willie Stuckey's dead. Willie Stuckey's not here anymore, sadly. And uh, sometimes I often think that could be me. Dr. Carter's office. Hey, Ruben, how are you doing? It's Ken. Hey, Ken, how are you? I am just fine. Just Ruben's fine. health was rapidly deteriorating. The man who brought this whole team together could no longer be the figurehead in the fight for David's freedom. David should have been out of him years ago. You know, and I feel so bad about that, because I just wasn't up to snuff. On the day we were scheduled to do an interview, he said he didn't have the energy to see us. He agreed to take a phone call, though. I first I let him down because I didn't get in there and kick ass the way I should have. <laughs> How are you feeling? Are you okay? Nah, I'm not okay. I can't do any more talking. All right, okay, bye. feel, feel bye. better. Take care, Ruben. That's uh, that's sad. Um, he doesn't have um, he doesn't have a lot left. I mean, he he gave you everything he had because it was you. Ruben didn't want any kind of funeral or memorial service. For his last public act, he wrote a letter stating that his single regret in life was that David McCallum was still in prison. And for his dying wish, he called upon the district attorney to grant David a full hearing. The letter was republished around the world. And we promised Ruben that we'd keep fighting until David's name is cleared. And if it means trying to find the killers 28 years later, then that's what we're going to do. Trying to find the real killers brings us back to Chrissy because she saw two guys that day who didn't match David and Willie's description because one of them had braids. So could these be the same two guys that kidnapped Nathan Blenner? You know, sometimes you got to go over the paperwork over and over again. Try to be objective, don't be judgmental. Four days after Nathan Blender's kidnapping, Chrissy reported that her car had been stolen. Chrissy and Nathan Blender had the exact same car. When you look closely at the investigation reports, you see that Detective Buddha actually did question two guys who matched Chrissy's description before he even knew about David and Willie. They were carjackers and had been arrested in Nathan Blender's neighborhood. What's more reasonable, that professional car thieves accosted Nathan Blenner and pulled this off, or two 16-year-old kids without a motive and no gain pulled this off? The first suspect, and we're going to call this guy Jake, he gave Detective Buddha a ton of information. Not only did he have a history of violent crimes, he had a direct connection to Nathan Blenner's car. When police were searching the burnt Buick Regal, they found the kerosene can that was used to torch it. Buddha's partner recognized from the price tag that the kerosene can came from a local hardware store in Bushwick known as Pops. The suspect ends up working at this Pops hardware store where the kerosene can came from. And that remarkable coincidence, frankly, that incredible accomplishment of good police work goes unfollowed up. No one does anything with that. Buddha's report gives us almost no information on the second guy, the guy with braids, who we're going to call Murray. He's currently on probation, and Van found his sister's address. That's where he's supposed to be staying. He's visited with her a number of times. 
she's really nice and keeps trying to connect us with her brother, but he's clearly dodging. Hello? Yes, uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Private Investigator Van Padgett. Oh, hi, Van. How are you? How are you? How's everything? <laughs> I'm still trying to get in contact with your brother. Have you heard okay. anything? Yes, he was here yesterday. Did he leave a forwarding address or a number that we can reach him at? No, he didn't have no phone, but he'll be here Monday. So we tried one last time, hoping to catch him there that Monday. All right. Good luck. Hey, hey, we don't believe in luck. Luck is for non-believers. How you doing? Okay, my pleasure, my pleasure. We had missed him again. Yes, ma'am. But this time, his sister revealed new information not contained in any police report. Even before her brother was arrested in Queens, he had already been questioned for Nathan Blenner's murder. Police had raided their house and taken him to the station. The police immediately started looking at him. When they came, they came full force, full force. How many cops was it? About eight. But they put my brother down really quick. Yes, they really? They told him it was okay. about... He's gonna be charged with the body from the park. They go, just tell me if you ain't the one, tell me who it is. Then I'll tell you, my brother will die and go to hell before he snitch on somebody. That's not him. Do you recall how long after they discovered the body in the park that the police came to your house? Two days. Was he known in the neighborhood to these detectives? He had some dirty connections with police, you know? Mm -hmm. He had some dirty raw deals with mm -hmm. him. Like, did she say anything that would lead you to believe that he actually did it? What she's saying is that they came immediately after the, after they discovered the body. Like two to three days afterwards. But he wasn't giving it up. He wasn't like David and them. You know, he wasn't this kid that you can just like, I'm gonna beat it out of you. Okay, keep beating I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Murray just keeps dodging us. But there's one place that you can't hide. Van saw that Murray had been arrested and he and Oscar jumped on the opportunity to pay him a visit. He confirmed everything his sister told us, and more. He tells us he was questioned about this case no less than four times. So did you get a signed affidavit? I'm looking at it right now, but I have So he signed an affidavit, which is like a sworn statement. It doesn't prove that David didn't do it. I had this foolish idea that he was just gonna to admit to everything, and that didn't happen, so it's not a home run. Ultimately, we still need to figure out why David and Willie were arrested in the first place. At one point, you could see Buddha was building a case. And I think somewhere along the line, something happened where he decided he's gonna create a case. So how did police go from suspecting Murray and Jake, two hardened criminals with a direct connection to Nathan Blenner's car, to David and Willie? The link is an alleged gun dealer. When Jake was being interrogated by Buddha, he told him that a guy from his neighborhood named James Johnson owned a gun that had been used in a murder. Buddha then questioned Johnson, who said, Willie Stuckey has my gun. He testified to this at trial. In exchange for that testimony, the police and the prosecution let Johnson off the hook for a very serious case that he was facing. And that was a huge, huge deal in Johnson's favor, obviously. If it wasn't for Johnson's story about the gun, David and Willie never would have been picked up. We don't know if this was the same gun that killed Nathan Blenner because they never found a gun. Here is Stuckey in jail. The police officer says to him, where is the gun? I put the gun upstairs in my house. OK, I'm, where did you put it in your house? One of my mattress. The police officer goes to the bedroom and doesn't find the gun, and never finds the gun. So why would Stuckey truthfully confess to murder, but then lie about where he hid the murder weapon? 
And that's how absurd this case is. It's all hearsay. We looked everywhere for James Johnson. Oscar and I went to a bunch of old addresses. I'm looking for a guy named James Johnson. Loose it up on the third floor. No, the house is empty because he's being in the house now. Oh, it's empty? So that's a dead end. But Van received new information on a person who we believed was the guy we'd been looking for. Six. There you go. There you go. Are you familiar with David McCallum? I'm on go. Well, this, we were looking at, um, did you testify in 80, in 86? I've never testified for anything, not even for myself. <laughs> the year that, that's in question would be like 85, 86. 85, 86. You was incarcerated then? Yes, I was. I was 19. We checked the records and it was true. At the time of the trial, this guy was in jail under a completely different name. We kept looking, but there are more than a dozen other James Johnsons in the New York justice system, all about the right age. Hello? Look for James Johnson? The only good thing about searching for a guy with such a common name is that there's always the next James Johnson. So the search continues and it won't stop until we find our guy. So David's fourth parole hearing is rapidly approaching and every year he has to decide whether or not to admit guilt and remorse, which we think would give him a better chance of getting out. As his lawyer, I have to let him know what the options are that he has to getting out of jail. And I said, you know, David, there may come a time where it's in your best interest to just wave the white flag. I've thought about it, and I could not see myself sitting in front of anyone and admitting guilt in this crime. I, I can't do it, and I won't do it, and if it takes Dying in prison, I would do that. I just don't think it would be the right thing to do for me and for anyone that support me and care about me and, and love me and, and believe in me. I would rather die in prison. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Because he's been in jail for so long, and he has such a good behavior record, the parole board can still grant him release if they don't feel like he's a threat to society. Just because he won't admit guilt doesn't mean that he won't get out this time. What's going on, Ray? I'm definitely looking forward to my upcoming parole hearing. Hope is all I have left, and as long as I can breathe, I will hold on to hope, because hope inspires freedom. With our investigation dead in the water, parole is now our only hope of getting David out of prison. Hey, speaker first. Yeah, now I can put it back on speaker. Hello? Hey. What's up, man? How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Hey, where mom at? Oh, she's right here next to me. Can yeah. I speak to her, please? Sure. Sweet. He's like, he's on speaker. Hello? Hey, sweetie, how you doing? I'm okay. You got some good news for me? No, Ma. No, they did it again, Ma. You know? Oh, no. Yeah. Don't worry about that, okay? Everything will be all right. Yeah, you keep telling me that. You're going to hang in there, though, right? Yeah, I know that. Me, yeah, it kind of, you know, yeah. slowed me down a little bit. Did I have a question to ask you? Sure. Of all the things that come back negative to you, 
How can you stay strong like that? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, um, I, you know, because I know the truth of what happened here, and I got a lot of family support like you, right? Yep. And I got a lot of friends mm-hmm. who believe in me. That always helps out, especially at a time like this when things don't go right. I got people who support me. And that's a blessing, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And I'm breathing and I'm alive. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to always try to get out. I'm not going to let them win, okay? Okay. Daniel? I'm here, sweetie. I'm just listening to you. I'm just, I am think, I don't know, I think you're getting ready to make me cry. You know that? Fuck day, I just wish he was out there with me, you know? Mm-hmm. Parole decision denied. Parole is denied for the following reasons. After a careful review of your record in this interview, it is the determination of this panel that if released at this time, there is a reasonable probability that you will not live and remain at liberty without violating law and your release is incompatible with the welfare and safety of the community. David is 45 years old. If you just think about what the average person does between the ages of 17 and 45, the tragedy of David's wrongful convictions should hit home to you. I'm proud of who he became, but I'm not proud that he was there. But, uh, I feel like it made a man out of him. I really do. I have to stay connected to the outside because this experience has showed me that it's more to life than just yourself, you know? He's a remarkable human being. He's an example to everybody. I don't ever want him to think that his life has been in vain. It's a tragedy that he's been in prison, but his life has meaning for a lot of people. It seems crazy that it would take you writing to me for me to like appreciate, you know, having a relationship with my father. You know, I guess sometimes that's what it takes. Right. And for the record, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Because you saved that relationship. For you to sit there and say that, uh, you know, you don't really know how much that kind of means to me because my father, of course, you know, he passed away in 2005, you know, and I came to prison at the age of 16. That's not really a lot of time to spend with your father, you know? Do you want to be a father? Yes. Yes, I do. He didn't even hesitate to answer Yes, I do, because I understand the value of being a father, how important it can be. Um, I think I deserve to be. It's not too late to, to live, you know, and that's what I want to do when I, when I get out. It's funny, because, like, it's hard for me to envision him, you know, walking out, because it's such a beautiful vision that I almost won't let myself go there, you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to get my hopes up too, too big and get them let down. I just want to be able to walk down the street, you know? Uninhibited, just, just walking. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm kind of, I guess in some ways I'm looking for a miracle, man. I'm trying to hold on to that, man. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right? Okay. See you later.
Gentlemen, you follow me? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Straight, you say? Our investigation was at a dead end. But then a new district attorney was elected in Brooklyn. And one of his promises was to look at wrongful conviction cases in a completely new way. When I walked through the doors of this office in January, I inherited a legacy of disgrace with respect to wrongful conviction cases. We have over 100 of these cases to review. With the old DA, proof of innocence was the only way to get a wrongful conviction claim back into court. But Ken Thompson set up a unit to actually reinvestigate some of these cases. I made a pledge to the people of Brooklyn, and my pledge was to put the guilty away, but also to make sure that our criminal justice system was based on fundamental fairness. The DA's office was flooded with claims of wrongful conviction, just like ours. But then, in June of 2014, we got news that they were going to reinvestigate David's case. Four long months later, they called to tell us that on October 15th, David was going to get his day in court. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> the handsome young man looking for you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, how you feeling, man? Great. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that Murray's signed affidavit, along with Ruben's plea, had been enough to pique the interest of the DA and get David's case to the top of the list. M-I-C-H-E-L-E-N, the defendants moved and that the defendants' constitutional rights were violated in the trial and that the defendants have obtained newly discovered evidence. Your Honor, the people do not oppose the, uh, the motion since the only evidence was the statements against them in which we have no confidence, we would ask that the indictments be dismissed. Against this backdrop and the evidence available to the district attorney after the investigation uh, sufficiently con convinces the court that the judgments of conviction should be vacated and based upon the people's further representation that they possess insuff insufficient evidence to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, I will dismiss the indictment. Wow. You know? Yeah. All right. Hey, Johnny, you work 
this thing. You know how to work. Gotta go see my sister now. Hey, sweetie. You happy to see me? You happy to see me, right? I'm happy to see you too, sweetie. Probably tomorrow we're gonna be watching live television together. You know that? Yeah, let me give me a kiss there. Mm. I love you. Watching David walk out of jail, it was just an amazing thing to be a part of. I can't, I can't put it into words. Y'all over Twitter. Okay. Do you know what that is? Uh, I know it's an account, that's about it. It's like a, so it's like, look, it's like a site, right? When you post something, it's tweeted. So many to choose from, man. Yeah, I know it's so many, right? I guess need to choke your feet. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, they feel good. Yeah, real good. This isn't a totally happy ending. David faces huge challenges. He got 30 years of his life taken from him and he can never get that back. But, you know, Reuben Carter said in his dying wish that to live in a world where truth matters and justice, however late, really happens, that would be heaven enough for us all. Uh, so I'm gonna go with um, the omelets, right? And I'm gonna go with the um the home fries, man. His dying wish came true. Feta omelet, that's you. <laughs> and for one little moment, in a little corner of Brooklyn, New York, all was right with the world. I was over there. Something I had to say to you, but I forgot. Just that quick, because I'm so upset. Oh, I can't believe I'm, can't believe I'm sitting here, man. I can't believe I'm sitting here. It's, I, I cannot believe it. <laughs> How you feeling? as happy as I've ever been in my life. It, it is dreamlike. Uh, all of a sudden, the dream came true. Well, we kept looking at each other and saying, how did this happen? I mean, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Nobody would be. Not Ruben, not Oscar, nobody, not Van. That may be true. It's 100% true. But you know, when you get down to it, and this is the God's honest truth, it was David. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their love and support. I just want everyone at this table to know that I truly, truly appreciate everything. And I mean everything that was ever done for me in this regard, and it will never be forgotten. Thank you very much. Hey. Hey. It's a pier, right? Can't believe I'm standing on a pier, man. Or... So what are you doing next week? Not a whole lot. You wanna go see a movie? Sure. <laughs> Why not?